level up a few thousand degrees with a Lava Hot Podcast and host Joseph Connell Jr. You'll hear from ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things. From tech startup CEOs and marketing professionals to authors, investors, and sales trainers, this show will be packed with information to help you level up in life or business, taking you from on fire up to lava hot. Get ready to burn this mother down. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Lava Hot Podcast. Today, we are with uh, President and CEO of Lions Mark Capital, author of several books, including How I Built a $37 Million Insurance Agency, The Icon Effect, Premium Financed uh, Life Insurance, Ouch, Living Outside the Cubicle, Checkmate, and The Takeo Effect, which is the most recent book for uh, an incredible individual, Mr. Darren Sugiyama. Did I say that correctly? Sugiyama. Sugiyama. Yeah. My apologies. That's all right. <laughs> yep. But I appreciate you coming on and being on the show today. Um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to diving into uh, the most recent book, uh, The Takeo Effect. From what I've gathered in, you know, some of the research that I put together is that this is a sequel to The Icon Effect. And I just have a, a, a bunch of different things that I would like for us to dive into. But uh, before I get started in that introduction, is there anything that I missed? Oh, I think that's pretty good. Good, good. Yeah, you know, for me, uh, I got into the insurance industry uh, about four years ago, and that's where I discovered you. Uh, getting into the insurance world, I started looking into books, and the one book that I grabbed was uh, How I Built a $37 Million uh, Insurance Agency. And then I connected with you on Facebook. The one thing that I really liked is that you were very open. You were very, uh, not everybody on social media is as easy to communicate with. And when I reached out to you for the show, I was you know, very pleased that you were willing to come on. And timing wise, it sounded great because you had the new book that was coming out. And I'm really hoping we can dive into that. What lessons somebody will learn from that, uh, from that book. And I, I think we'll just kind of go in from there. So before we go into the Takeo effect, I was hoping you could give us a brief overview of the icon effect, because from what I gathered, this is like a sequel to that book. That's right. Uh, this is the Icon Effect was actually the first book I ever wrote that was in a, a fictional format. You know, mm -hmm. Most of my books are more instructional, kind of uh, almost like a, a training manual, uh, if you will. Um, but with the Icon Effect, I kind of stole the format from Paulo Coelho's The Alchemist. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. So it was a The Alchemist was mm -hmm. a, uh, a fictional story, a short novel that had these life lessons Kind of woven into the fabric of, of the of the story and so i thought you know i'd never written fiction before and uh me with my big ego said well why not <laughs> <laughs> put this into a, a fictional format maybe it'll help engage a, a, an audience that maybe might not be so engaged by uh, an instruction manual so the, the format of the icon effect is about a uh, 27 year old uh kid now that i'm an old 50 year old man now a 27 year old kid yeah. kid named vincent uh, recently divorced, kind of lost in his career, lost in his life. And he uh, uh, kind of coincidentally meets a very successful, uh, very powerful businessman uh, that he calls the icon. And the icon takes him under his wing and not only teaches him uh, how to be successful in business, but also gives him a new outlook on, on life and love and uh, what's most important in life. Um, and so a lot of this, the, the stories I use in, in my fictional writing are very autobiographically inspired. Yeah, I, life has kind of imitated art. No, it's the other way around. Art, art has imitated a lot of my life. Very cool. So with going from there into the next book, so some of the things that uh, I, in what I was going over is that you ha in this new book, there's a number of different topics between flexibility and unbreakable, repairing damage, overcoming setbacks, and the benefits of that damage, embracing imperfections and celebrating uh, the way things are rather than the way we think or wish that they would be, uh, not letting others dictate our generosity and ethics. I, I wanted to try to dive into that because that seemed to be, um, you know, it, how this book is structured, starting with the, the flexibility and being unbreakable. In, in business and in life, I was hoping you could kind of share uh, some of that aspect with us. Sure. 
you know, I, I, I think the majority of, of us that uh, started off in our careers or started off our businesses uh, that have gone through you know, the struggle of the early years of trying to get something off the ground, uh, we all know the sacrifice it takes and, and the pain and the heartache that, that you go through. Um, and, and if you're one of the lucky few who happens to um, achieve success, you start to try to create, I guess, an image that exudes success because when you struggle for so long, I think uh, some of us, myself included, uh, developed a pretty heavy chip on our shoulder and we want people to know uh, that we are now successful because we spent so many years being unsuccessful. Um, and what I've seen a lot of people do, and I, I've done this myself, again, I'm totally guilty of it, is uh, we want people to think of uh, our personal lives and our business lives as being so shiny and perfect and pristine um, and powerful and, and void of any, uh, you know, flaws. And, and that just is not reality. And so you look at us on social media now. I mean, this goes all the way down to little kids now are, are posting these pictures and these stories that make their life look perfect. And yeah. what happens is other people get on, they see these seemingly perfect lives and it makes them feel bad about themselves and bad about their lives because their life is not perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what they don't realize is all this fake stuff you see on social media, you know, their lives aren't so perfect either. And so what, what I've learned to embrace in very recent years um, is, is to really embrace the imperfections of life. And I learned a lot of this through kind of reconnecting with my, with my Japanese roots and my Japanese culture. So a lot of the lessons that I talk about in the icon effect uh, that are woven into the fabric of the story are really around celebrating the imperfections and understanding that uh, no one has a perfect life. And instead of trying to hide our imperfections uh, to uh, not only be open with them, but to highlight our imperfections, because I think there, there's nothing more empowering than seeing a very successful person admit that their life has not been so perfect. <laughs> yeah. Makes you feel that, well, maybe, <laughs> since my life is not perfect, maybe there's a chance, you know, and hopefully that's empowering for people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So going from the icon effect into the into this new book, uh, the Takeo effect, um, what is what happens within that journey for Vincent? Yeah, not, not to spoil the story for those that uh, obviously no one's read this yet, except for you and a very small handful of people. Uh, the release date is coming up in the next uh, couple of months here. Um, but, you know, v Vincent goes from from uh, kind of nothing to really, really kind of making it. I'll use air quotes here, making it uh, and becomes very successful uh, due to the being the due to the tutelage of his his new mentor um, in the icon effect. His mentor uh, passes away and, and that's kind of right at the height of Vincent's success. As, as we transition from the icon effect story into uh, the Takeo effect, you know, fast forward um, about eight years or so, uh, Vincent is faced with a whole new set of challenges. Um, and I think this is something that a lot of people that feel that they have made it, they mm -hmm. have the, uh, the uh, they're under the illusion <laughs> that they're all their troubles are gone because now they're successful. Uh, what they don't understand is that as you kind of approach the second half of your life, um, oftentimes we're, we're faced with a whole new set of challenges that we didn't expect. And so Vincent is now having to navigate through this uh, second stage of his life without his mentors. And um, he, meets uh, a new mentor, a mentor that just so happens to be uh, Japanese ethnically and has also gotten in touch with his Japanese roots and teaches Vincent um, the tenets of what they call the Bushido Code, which are the seven virtues that the samurai warriors, warriors uh, used to live by. And so it's similar to the lessons that he learned from his previous mentor, the icon and the icon effect, but mm -hmm. it comes from a very different angle. Um, I would argue a more authentic angle a more transparent angle. And that's kind of a part of this personal evolution I've gone through in my own life over the last, you know, 10, 12 years here. Right. Very cool. Yeah. So, so in the book, some of the other stuff that you dive into is, uh, you know, being true to yourself and going above and beyond. Uh, the way I, I took it was uh, even if somebody, if you're not expecting a return, you know, uh, being true to yourself and, uh, not letting others kind of dictate your generosity, ethics, uh, uh, or forward momentum. I was hoping you could touch on that a little bit. Um, you know, to you within your business, within you know uh, 
your life and how that applies and what um you know what message you were trying to deliver just within that aspect sure um you know the first tenet of the bushido code uh, is called gi gi uh, mm -hmm. which uh, in english the english translation is righteousness so what's really interesting that i find fascinating about the samurai culture is that they viewed um uh, living a righteous life uh living a life based on of, of, of justice um is that these principles are fundamentals in terms of the way that the samurai live their life um but what i found even more fascinating was that they made a, a very clear distinction um that common men non-samurai oftentimes did, did not live a life based on these this code of honor and so the samurai never expected their their um their righteous way of living uh, to be reciprocated. And I think a lot of times, again, myself included, I'm I'm embarrassed to say, but I'm also liberated to say that in the past, I tried to do good things for, for people that I thought were good. And, and oftentimes my kindness and generosity was not reciprocated. In fact, yeah. many times it was, uh, that was betrayed, not only taken for granted, but really betrayed. And it was uh, very hurtful. I've had uh, employees that I, I personally mentored uh, turn on me and, and cause all kinds of havoc. I've had business partners uh, leave and, and be I mean, it's, it's been a rough road. But what I didn't understand then that I understand now is that, that the again, to, to, to take a page out of this, this uh, Bushido code, um, is that we shouldn't live our lives uh, based on our values, because we expect to get that reciprocated to us, we should almost expect that it's not reciprocated to us. Right. Because the reason why we should live by this code of honor is because we believe in it as a fundamental, not right. as a tool to get something that we want from somebody else. Yeah. And um, uh, I used to uh, I used to internally be a bit boastful, quite frankly, about, oh, I'm so generous. Oh, I'm so giving. But I had to take a real hard look in the mirror and say, well, am I being generous because it's in my nature to be generous because I truly believe in that as a principle mm -hmm. or am I doing it expecting that I get something in return? And in business, oftentimes we do things to get something in return. Uh, and that's, that's been a big evolution for me. Now I still um, operate under the same code of honor, but I never expect to get it back. Yeah. I want to be able to look in the mirror and say, I have lived my life. I have operated in business as well as my personal life um, at, at the highest standard uh in terms of my code of honor and whether or not it comes back to me that is irrelevant yep. what's relevant is for me to be able to say this is what i believe in and my actions are congruent with what i say i believe in yep. not to get any sort of special credit yeah uh you know one, one other thing that you go into is uh kind of like the mental health side for for men um you know depression uh and the almost i was trying to think of the best way to say this but it's almost like, uh, you know, it, as a society for men and individuals uh, that run a household, it's almost like taboo to have any sort of mental type of things going on um, because, you know, we're supposed to just lead a house. But I, I, I love the fact that you do go into that and talk about um, more or less that, you know, men are, are built so that they shouldn't have weaknesses, but we do, we're, we're human beings. So we do have some of that. I was hoping you could hit on that and just touch on some of that aspect of it as well um, for, for everybody listening. Sure, yeah, I mean, not to take anything away from what women go through. I mean, I, I guess in many ways, I would argue that women go through a lot deeper, difficult challenges than, than, than men do. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll just speak as a man, um, you know, men in this culture, we are not, uh afforded the luxury of being depressed or or being afraid or showing weakness we are taught that we are supposed to be the super supermen you know the superhuman leaders of our family impervious to self-doubt uh, impervious to depression and um, i know a lot of men struggle behind the scenes of they put up this front that they're so strong and that they're so uh, bulletproof mm -hmm. but in the background um a lot of men are unraveling and, and I use this analogy in, in the Takeo effect of, of it's like, it's like 
it's like looking like you are this perfect, beautiful, you know, cashmere sweater that looks so perfect from the outside, but inside there's a little snag and someone is slowly pulling that thread and this beautiful sweater is slowly unraveling from the inside yet to the outside eye, it's completely undetectable. And that for men specifically creates a very, very lonely existence. Mm -hmm. I've been through this several times. I've been through this you know, recently going through some major struggles and uh, in, in business and, and, and financial and, and betrayals and all, all, all this stuff, all these principles that I wrote about uh, in the Takeo effect. And that's it, a level of lon loneliness, but perhaps even more destructive than the loneliness is it's, it's embarrassing. It's like, I, I can only describe it as the feeling of being embarrassed about being embarrassed. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. Multi-level uh, uh, embarrassment, depression, you know, self-loathing you know, existence. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, 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 a, if a man, especially, especially someone that claims to be an alpha male, which a lot of us business folks do, we're, we're leaders, right? We're the, we're the, we're the, uh, uh, you know, bulletproof uh, uh, tycoons that go out there and take over the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, and when we don't feel good about ourselves, when we feel like we're losing, when we feel like a loser, um, it can be extremely destructive because who do we go to talk to? Right. The fear I think for men is that if we go and we, 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 uh, we admit that we're unraveling inside, we feel, we fear that we'll be judged. We mm -hmm. fear that maybe people won't want to do business with us because no one wants to do business with a weak loser who's unraveling inside. Right. Yeah. Um, and for the haters out there, they love it. Right. I mean, they, they, they're praying for your downfall. So if they find out that you've fallen on hard times, uh, they may secretly celebrate or they may celebrate in public. And so that fear of, of being judged and the fear of being condemned, yep. especially when you've reached you know, a certain level of success to hit, to hit rock bottom again, uh, it can be very difficult, very embarrassing for, for an alpha male. So what I'm trying to do in this book is, is help specifically help men understand that there's nothing wrong with falling on hard times. There's nothing wrong with having to start over and reinvent yourself. And that may take longer <laughs> than you would like it to take. Yeah. It always takes longer, right? Yep. Yeah. And, and it, you almost have to just embrace, in, in some cases, you got to try to embrace the failure. But I, I would imagine just try to see through the failure to the other side um, and recognize that in some areas, you know, failure is going to be part of the process. Well, not yet. Not only is failure a necessary part of the process, but I, 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 for myself, it has been a, a real cleansing, very liberating uh, experience. I, I've gone through several cycles of downfalls and destruction and rebuilding and, and all that sort of thing. But, but what it's done for me is sometimes, sometimes we have to fall in hard times to reach out and ask for help. In my personal life, I, in my spiritual life, um, I have found that sometimes I need to be be, be uh, brought down to my knees to kind of re-engage my relationship with God. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes when everything's going great, uh, your ego gets a hold of you. You think, well, I did all this on my own, <laughs> which nothing could be further from the truth, at least for, in my life. Yeah. Um, but so, sometimes when we're humbled like that, we really – uh, reconnect with what's important. And, um, I think for a lot of folks, if, if they could see the result of their relationship with their spouse, the relationship with their kids, the relationship with God, if, if they have a spiritual life, then they would be grateful for the hard times because the hard times oftentimes reconnect you, um, with what's most important and, and, and with those relationships. Uh, you know, I said a lot of this, um, reconnecting with my own Japanese culture uh, and infusing that in this book, it, it's really been kind of a cool thing for me. Uh, there, there's a Japanese term called uh, wabi-sabi. Mm -hmm. Wabi-sabi is usually 
referred to in the form of an aesthetic. So like an art form, a style of art, a style of architecture, a style of decor. Um, but Wabi Sabi, so Wabi is translated um, to English as rustic simplicity. Uh, sabi in the Wabi Sabi is um, kind of in line with embracing the imperfections. So mm-hmm. when you see a, a, a hand handmade coffee mug or teacup or something like that that's asymmetrical that's clearly handmade the imperfections of it are what make it beautiful versus like a, a machine shop you know coffee mug that where they produce you know a gazillion of them right um th- there's a beauty in the imperfection of it and the other thing about wabi sabi is uh with certain objects as they age over time they don't get beat up they patina right so yeah. the the more imperfect they become, the cooler they become. And, and the, the, as they age, they take on a, a new sense of beauty, a new sense of, of, of richness. And, and that element really can be applied to life, right? If we view our current circumstances as not only beautiful, the imperfections, um, but none of our circumstances as they sit today are permanent, right? That we're, right. This is a temporary moment in a hopefully a long number of years of, of experience in our life. And so if we can embrace the imperfections and say, you know, nothing is permanent, whether good or bad, right? Nothing is permanent. Everything is ever evolving. Yeah. We can embrace the imperfection and embrace the, the current state, whatever current state we're in. And oftentimes our current state is not our ideal state. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah, and w- one other thing that you guys yeah, that you go into not you guys but we, that you go into uh, in the book is uh, submitting to God's plan. Um, I felt like you were kind of hitting on some of that, um, you know, when we were talking about the mental health side of things, but um, but we didn't really dive into that aspect of it. So I was hoping you could, uh, you know, go into to that detail of you know submitting to God's plan um, from from wherever you are and just going with that commitment. Sure. You know, I, I, I used to be up until I was just before I turned 19, actually through age 19. Um, I was atheist. I didn't believe that God existed. I didn't have, I didn't believe any, I thought it was just nonsense. Um, just before my 19th birthday, I don't know if you know this part of my life story, but actually I got shot in a drive-by shooting, uh, car to car assault style with a shotgun. Wow. Um, I still have about 30, uh, I think it was bird shot, uh, still embedded in the back of my skull. Uh, I should have died many, many times over. Not, not just that, um, not just that experience. Um, and, and as I was slumped over on the steering wheel of my car, cause I was driving, um, waiting for the ambulance to come blood gushing out all over the place. I was about to pass out. Um, I, uh, as an atheist, I, I, uh, I asked God for a second chance Wow. and, and not, not knowing what, that meant um, at the time. Um, I went another year or so, still being an atheist. And uh, <laughs> right after, I just prayed to God for another chance, and I survived. Went right back to being an atheist, <laughs> just like that. Uh, and it wasn't until about a year later where um, uh, my life really took a, a, a turn for the better, and um, uh, I got very involved in, in, in my spiritual life as, as a Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, started teaching. Uh, kids in Sunday school uh, worked in a gang prevention program in downtown Long Beach and, and really took a different path uh, after I got done with school and, and uh, started looking for a career. Um, but the, um, the concept I was taught early on in, in my spiritual life was this concept of submitting to God's will, mm-hmm. uh, trusting in God. Man, I didn't figure all this out. I still don't have not figured it out, but I have not figured it out what I know now. It took me, you know, I turned 50 last year and I just about figured this out last year that there's a difference between trusting that God is going to make all your dreams come true Mm -hmm. and truly submitting to God's will, whatever that may be, and being okay with that. Now, as a type A personality and a very motivated, driven businessman, I have always had a very clear picture in my mind of what the desired outcome was, right? I'm very goal oriented. Yep. What I learned as I went through some pretty major challenges was that there's a difference between 
trusting that God is, is, is going to uh, do what you want him to do, like a genie in a bottle, mm-hmm. versus saying, hey, I submit. If, if it means that, that I have to, I'm going to lose everything and, 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 and lose my house and lose this lifestyle, and I got to start over in a one bedroom apartment with my family, if, if that's what's best for my spirit, mm-hmm. then God, I'm down. I'll go with that. If that's truly what's best for my spirit, that is submitting to God's will. Now, clearly, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is not my preference. Yeah. Right? And I let God know that, God, this is, that's not my preference. Yeah. But, but if that's really what you feel I need to do to get to do whatever it is that you need to do in my life, I'll go with it. Now, fortunately for me, I, however you want to look at that, that did not happen. But but I was at that point where where I was willing to to go along with that because I trust in God's plan so much. And I, I could not say that 49 and a half years of my life. Yeah. I, I could not have said that up until last year. And it's like the minute I truly believed in that, I can't explain it. But all of a sudden business started pouring in and new relationships filled filled old relationships that were recently vacated that I didn't expect to, to, to have them vacate. And, um, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And that relinquishing of, of my agenda and and being able to say, Hey, I'll go with your agenda, um, time and time again. And especially this last time around, um, I was dreaming too small. (laughs) <laughs> the, right. the opportunities that I've been afforded with now are so far greater than what I was thinking that I wanted it just as short as a year ago. Yeah. And, and, and you know me, I mean, I, I dream pretty big, you know what I mean? Yeah. I have pretty big aspirations. So, so to say that the opportunities I'm being afforded now are multiple times bigger than what I uh, originally set out to accomplish uh, is, uh, says a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm right there with you. I, within the last year, I kind of discovered on my own that that I really was setting my sights way short, you know, and it, it's all out there is the main thing is that, you know, God provides in 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 different ways. And there's so much out there. There's if, with the abundant mindset. And what I realized personally is that not only was I setting just my goals too low, but my activity for those goals, for the goals that I was hitting, wasn't even that much. Like it, like I, it was an easy goal, so it was easy to hit. And what I started realizing is by shifting my sights, it, it I'll put it this way, those goals were what's in it for me. It wasn't what's, what can I give? And that was the big thing. That was the big shift for me is how can I give as much as I can? It's one reason why I started a podcast that's centered around bringing on individuals like you that have something to share with a uh, a specific type of audience. Me personally, it was a lot of, I want to try to deliver a message to salespeople, to business owners, to entrepreneurs, to really just any individual, a mother trying to sell their kid on, you know, why they need to get up for school every day. And, you know, once I made it more about how how I can give and it aligned that with my own personal goals of what I'm trying to achieve to what you just said, opportunities started coming in. You know, the, the phone calls of people that want to work with me as an individual started coming in and I would imagine they're going to continue to come in. And that wasn't my initial intentions. My intentions weren't, you know, the, the question early on is how do you monetize a podcast? I really had no idea that wasn't the intentions. It wasn't to monetize a podcast. It was, I just want to have this platform to be able to interview people that I'm interested in. Uh, more often than not, it's typically authors because I, I'm a big reader, big library. I, you know, I, my wife will say that I'll, I'll buy six books before I read the one book that, <laughs> that I bought a couple of days ago. And it's just because if I see something that interests me, uh, Audible is uh, probably my, 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 my main addiction. It's very easy for me to go on there and buy books and I'll turn my car into a drive time university. So um, I, I, I love what you said there because it's very true. Once you start, um, one, setting your sights higher and letting into that plan, you know, the, the opportunities start to develop and blossom. But um, 
Darren, as we start to wrap up this show, I want to make sure that I give you an opportunity to kind of let let the audience know, you know, if they want to get a copy of this book or any of the other books, where should they go? And then even just on the uh, uh, insurance side or with Linesmark, if you want somebody who's willing to reach out and connect with your company there, uh, where you would like them to go for that as well. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, all my books are available on, on Amazon. Uh, you just search my name, they will pretty much all pop up. Um, the, uh, the Takeo Effect, this is the book that's coming out shortly here. Um, I thought I was, this was going to be released last year. <laughs> yeah. It's funny how God's plan works again, right? Yep. I've had so many incredible experiences, both challenges as well as huge, huge blessings in the last, call it six to 12 months. Um, I couldn't not put that content in this book. <laughs> so I went through these made this pretty major rewrite. Um, and chopped a lot of uh, the content I already had out and inserted some of this new stuff. Um, and so I'm hoping to release uh, within, within the next couple of months here. Yep. Um, it's funny, as far as my primary business, Landsmark Capital is, is my main company. I have a, a small handful of other companies, but um, Landsmark Capital is the main one. Uh, we finance uh, what I would call extremely large life insurance policies. So average you know, size policy somewhere between 20 to a hundred million dollars. Um, clients will, uh, essentially finance the purchase of these policies, kind of like, uh, like buying a house with a mortgage, right? We, yeah. so we have 14 lenders on our platform. Uh, we design the, the life insurance policy. We coordinate with the appropriate lender based on the client's net worth, liquidity, and, you know, special needs and all that sort of thing. Sure. Um, and so we work with investment advisors and high-end life insurance uh, uh, advisors all over the country. Uh, we're kind of like the hired gun that comes in to do this very micro niche uh, uh, specialty uh, service uh, for the clients. Uh, you can check us out at landsmarkcapital.com. Uh, you can also check uh, me out at my personal website at darrensugiyama.com. And from darrensugiyama.com, that, that's kind of the hub that shoots out to all the different companies as well as uh, my Amazon page. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Darren, I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. Um, you know, I, I loved having you on. I've been following you on social for, I think it's four or five years now. And, um, you know, I, I really appreciate you taking that time to come on here, share about the book and uh, very cool on, on what you do in the primary business as well. But um, it, it, just to be sure, is there is there anything that I might have missed that you would have preferred that I would have asked? No, I think you do a great job. Yep. You do a great job. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, you know what? That you're you're uh, you're the type of guest that I like to have on because I think you actually made me look good here. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you're doing just by yeah, without I, me. <laughs> I, I love a guest where you know, even if I stumble through how to ask the question, they deliver uh, on the back end with uh, amazing answers. So I appreciate you taking the time to come out and uh, come on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, very good. You've been listening to the Lava Hot Podcast with Joseph Connell Jr. Do you want to level up your business in 2022? Then visit us at golavahot.com for a free marketing analysis. Get ready, get ready. You already know. Let's go.